Good evening. Welcome to our missions conference. We're looking forward to uh, several days together as we uh, see what God is doing around the world and ask God to work in our own hearts and to help us to see how we can take additional steps to grow in the area of evangelism in our own neighborhoods and our own part of the world. Let's stand together and turn to number 656 as we begin. Number 656 and sing our theme song for the week, Send the Light. turn back to number 442 number 442 if we're going to make a difference in our own neighborhoods and where god has led us then we have to be willing to follow so let's sing this together number 442 verses one and three we'll sing one and three i will follow Number three, I surrender all. seated at this time our secondary choir is going to sing a song entitled not ashamed
that could be a true testimony from every one of us. I am not ashamed to own my Lord. Jesus is worthy of our loyalty, isn't he? He's worthy of our service and our praise. Thank you for being here tonight. Welcome to Dyer Baptist Church Missions Conference 2022. It is a special delight to have you here. Thank you for uh, arranging your schedule to make it happen. Uh, it is um, a special week we are praying that the Lord will work among us, that, that this will not just be an event on the calendar that comes and goes, but that it will be a time when God touches our hearts. Before we came out for the service tonight, we were praying that God would help us to love the things of eternity, to love invisible things, not physical things, and that God would order our priorities accordingly. So there'll be some announcements coming, but I just wanted to share my word of welcome. I'm glad you're here. We're looking forward to a wonderful week together. Let's join our hearts in prayer, shall we? Lord Jesus, you experienced such shame that we might be forgiven. Forgive us for our timidity and even cowardice when we aren't quick to identify with you. We are so glad to be yours. Help us to make sure that others know that too. And I pray that because of the time we spend together this week, our, our lives will shine brighter, that we will individually and collectively bring more honor and glory to your name, and that indeed your light would shine to the ends of the earth. Please work among us. Accomplish what only you can. Thank you for this opportunity. In Christ's name. I'm very pleased to introduce Brother Jake Allen, um, who made his way through Chicago traffic to be here, um, and that's a great blessing. Uh, the Allens are missionaries to Hungary, 
And I am excited for the presentation he's going to make because I don't know much about Hungary. Uh, and it's easy to sometimes lose those smaller European countries in just this big menagerie of, of places. And so we're eager to hear what the Lord has put on their heart, the opportunities that lie across the ocean. So, brother, would you come, please? All right, well, before I begin, I just want to say with that, uh, the young people who just sang, that was excellent. I really enjoyed that. That was really good. My name is uh, Jake Allen. My wife, Ramona, is here with me. We are missionaries to the country of Hungary. We have two small children, Abigail Grace. She is going to be five this next Monday, and uh, she's here with us tonight. And then Mark Gideon just turned two recently, uh, so we're... Uh, we never have dull moments on the road. We always have a lot of fun with our kids. And uh, so we're excited to be going to the land of Hungary. My wife, Ramona, is actually from the country of Hungary. So she, she does actually speak English, um, but she grew up speaking Hungarian, started learning English when she was around nine years old. You would hardly know that now. Um, but she has a little bit of an accent, but she speaks the Hungarian language fluently, and so hopefully she will keep me from making too many cultural blunders when we're over there. Um, that is if I listen to her, right? Um, but uh, we're, we're excited to get over there as quickly as we can. Um, before I forget this in the presentation, um, we are, we've been doing deputation now just about a year and a half, and we have just reached 64% of our support. So, and we have a goal of uh, making it to the field by the end of this calendar year, Lord willing. So uh, if you'd pray with us along those lines. So let me tell you a little bit about the country of Hungary. Um, some Hungarian inventions and discoveries. Uh, a Hungarian invented the Rubik's Cube. Uh, it was made by a man named Ernő Rubik. And so, uh, that's where that came from. And uh, we have one on our table downstairs. Anyone, if anyone's able to solve it, feel free to do so. I can't solve it yet, but I probably need to learn that before I go to Hungary. Uh, they also invented the ballpoint pen. Anyone used one of those before? Um, the binoculars, the safety match, one of the first helicopters, the soda water machine, uh, and a Hungarian discovered vitamin C. Uh, so who would have known that vitamin C wasn't just always on the shelf at Walmart? Uh, but Hungarians really do have a crisis, and the crisis is they have a lack of hope. Um, the Hungarian people are the eighth highest in alcohol consumption. Uh, they hold the 12th highest suicide rate in the world. At one point, the Hungarians uh, had the highest, the number one highest female suicide rate in the entire globe. Um, the, uh, these are just countries with uh, the most years of life lost due to alcohol. You can see Hungary is at the bottom of this list, um, but they, um, they are eighth in the world. And unfortunately, all of the countries above there are also within Europe. Uh, communism had a really uh, big part in um, Hungary's dark part of their history. Um, Hungary was a lot larger uh, country. They were known as the Kingdom of Hungary for a while. There's also the, the Austro-Hungarian um, Empire. Um, but World War I, uh, World War II, they ended up losing a lot of their borders. Um, and actually, Hungary ended up starting out on the Axis side of World War II. And by the time they realized they were on the wrong side of history, um, they were already um, under the thumb of Hitler and couldn't get out. And there's a lot of Hungarian people who were uh, slaughtered during that time, um, including Hungarian Jewish people. Um, there's, these are just some pictures of prisoners of war. You know, guys um, and girls of this age, you know, are thinking about graduating high school today. You know, what are they going to do for college? Well, these people were doing whatever they were told in hopes that they wouldn't end up being part of a heap of dead bodies that didn't do what they were told or didn't make people happy. Just a very uh, different time, and this is really not that long ago in history and a very uh, dark time for the Hungarian people. As a result, the Hungarian economy has suffered greatly, um, and so has their spiritual condition. 
Um, this is not my sermon title for later in the week, um, where this sign here says, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Um, this is just kind of a representation of how Hungary is um, moving more towards an atheistic uh, worldview. Um, uh, by the way, the fact that they have to make signs like this is kind of ironic to me. Like, if God does not exist, why do you have to pick it and promote that? Um, anyways, <laughs> but this, this is the, uh, hung, the uh, demographics of religion within uh, Hungary. Um, they were around six or seven years ago around 70% Catholic. That has dropped almost in half. They're around 35% Catholic now. And if you combine the two blue categories up there with either unaffiliated or atheist agnostic, that would be around 45% of the population would be in that category. There is also some reformed Protestant there. That's the yellow sliver, some Greek Catholic, and other would be um, the... Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Pentecostals, Charismatics, and Independent Baptists, and some others. Um, so there's very, uh, very small amount of, um, you know, hopefully some of the Reformed people would be saved, but we don't really know that for sure. Um, I mean, you don't know if anyone's saved for sure, unless they have put their trust in Christ. But that's just, um, so to put a, in perspective just of the current independent Baptist churches right now that are in the country of Hungary, um, there are currently only eight of them right now. Um, so my, my wife was, um, someone had mentioned missionary Jim Canise before. Has, does anyone remember him at all? Or He used to have, he had a, a quote or something that he said, I thought of stealing it, but, stealing it, but my wife didn't like the phrase. Um, but Brother uh, Paul brought it up today again. And Brother Canise, I said, when you're hungry, pray for Hungary. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe I should steal that. It's a pretty good little quip. But uh, anyways, he um, ended up leading my father-in-law to the Lord right around this area here in Page, and Ramona's dad helped to start that church there in Page, and then since they have gone to start the church right there in Naj Kanija. Um, but there are only eight uh, independent Baptist churches there in the country right now. There are at least, um, there's at least one other gospel preaching church that we know of, um, and he is starting another church. There may be a total of 10 evangelical churches soon, and a friends of ours who are missionaries are trying to start a church um, up there in a city called Niraj Haza. So hopefully there will be nine independent Baptist churches soon. Um, but just to put in perspective, some cities that have no independent Baptist church in them, there's just a ton. And there are actually 3,152 localities within Hungary, and there are only currently eight independent Baptist churches. And uh, something to think about with Hungary, Hungary is only around the size of the state of Indiana, so it's actually not huge um, compared to like the United States, but they have around 10 million people in that country. And when you drive to a different state um, here in this country, everyone pretty much speaks the same language for the most part, right? But for them, if they're going to cross borders, it can be a totally different language. Um, and uh, so but you think about people up here in a, a city called Chopran, for them to get to the nearest independent Baptist church within Hungary, it would be a two hour and 15 minute drive, um, according to Google Maps. So it is very spread out and there's just not good churches available for um, a majority of the Hungarian people. Uh, but we were able uh, to go on a survey trip this last summer. Um, that was really a privilege. Um, the only way we were able to go in when we did was because my wife Ramona is a citizen of Hungary. So we were able to get there. They allowed citizens and their families to go in, and that will also allow us to have more freedom no matter what, hopefully, no matter what the COVID restrictions are because she is a citizen, we should have an easier time getting into the country. Um, but we were able to be a part of a family camp where we were there, five of the eight independent Baptist churches uh, got together and had a good time of preaching, singing, teaching, um, playing games, obviously a bunch of food, fellowship, and such. Um, but that was a really good time to get to know a lot of the people there. And this is actually a very good representation of the independent Baptists within Hungary. There would be somewhere around 200 or less independent Baptists in Hungary right now. So there are not very many. Um, uh, but yeah, so, and uh, this, this right here is proof that we were actually there. That's us circled. Um, and uh, we were able to be a part of a youth conference while we were there as well. Um, 
these young people were really great. I was able to preach to them quite a few times. Um, we enjoyed some different activities and things together. Um, this group of young people is really amazing, and um, they are the future of reaching Hungary. Uh, a lot of these uh, young people, their parents were saved under one of the first churches planted back around the early 90s. And uh, we're just, just pray that God will use these young people to reach uh, their own people. Um, each one of these will always be able to speak Hungarian better than I ever will be able to. Um, I hope that I will learn Hungarian very well, um, but it just... They, they say, depending on what website you look at, by the way, Hungarian is either the third or fourth most difficult language for an English speaker to learn. So it's definitely a blessing. My wife already knows it, <laughs> but uh, I definitely need prayers and grace to learn the language. Um, I was able to preach around 20 times in six weeks, so they kept us uh, nice and busy while we were over there. Um, I was in five of the eight independent Baptist churches over there, as well as the youth conference. That was good opportunities. We were able to go to the city of Budapest uh, itself for 10 days, and we thought that it was only going to be three days without our children, but my in-laws offered to watch our kids for 10 days for us, so that was really awesome. Um, so our first day there in Budapest, we went to this church picnic, which was um, the four-year anniversary of this one church started in Budapest by Pastor Zoli Kish. The first day that we were there, someone went out of their way to come ask someone in their group because they talked to me and I had to ask my wife to translate for me. So he came up to us and he asked, why would you come and move to Hungary if, um, since life in the United States is so good? Why would you come and move here? Um, now, we didn't bother to explain to him we hadn't moved there yet, um, but I did come. I, he, he asked, and so I, I was able to go over to him and through a translator, let him know that the reason that we're coming to move back to Hungary is because we want to make sure that everyone has a relationship with God, that they know for sure their sins are forgiven and that they have eternal life. And I asked him if he knew that for sure, and uh, he was not certain. And so to save time, because he had to leave soon, I turned it over to Pastor Zoli, and he was able to share the gospel with him for a good 15 to 20 minutes before his ride came to pick him up. That was really, um, that was a great opportunity, and that was confirmation to me that we were going to the exact right location. We knew we were going to Hungary for sure, um, but the first day in Budapest where we felt God was calling us to be, um, someone had come and asked us that. Um, so we're very excited about getting there as quick as possible. Uh, but we had some time to survey the city of Budapest. Um, by the way, if you wanted a lesson in Hungarian, I'm not saying it wrong when I say Budapest, at least from um, Hungarian's perspectives. If you see an S in the Hungarian language, it makes the SH sound. So it is Budapest. And then if you want to say an S like we say it, you have to spell it SZ. So actually, you can see on the front of our Bible we have on our display table, it says Sent Biblia, which means Holy Bible. And the word Sent is spelled S-Z-E-N-T. So there you go, a free Hungarian language lesson for you. Um, another interesting thing about Hungary, which um, it is spelled differently, by the way. It's not just the, the hungry people, it's Hungary. Um, but in Hungary, if you look at their map, they don't call themselves the country of Hungary. They call themselves the country of or Magyarorsag, which means the, the country of the Magyars. So that is, they are actually the Magyar people, and uh, we say Hungarian. So, I mean, they know what it is when we talk about it, but that's, that's how they refer to themselves as, as the Magyar people. Anyways, you probably didn't want to hear any of that, but, um, <laughs> but we had some time to survey um, Budapest. Um, it really is a very beautiful city. Um, spent some time, this is the castle district out there, and you can see the Danube River from, it goes, it splits the city in half. Um, we were able to go up on top of St. Stephen's Basilica, not the church that we're going to be working at, um, but you can see there's actually the 12 apostles here um, on top of the, the church. Um, that's a, a Catholic church that they have there, but it's a panoramic view all the way around the city and really a beautiful uh, view of the city, but it just really is um, stirring to think all of those um, buildings, I mean, almost all of those are apartment buildings or places people live. I mean, there's so many people there. There's almost two million people that live just in the city of Budapest alone. Um, there are amazing sites, but Jesus' heart, of course, is eternal souls. Um, 
they were just, I was very stirred as we were uh, going through, um, just going through the city there, just seeing all the people. Um, I have a short video or a video clip here. Um, I was not actually moving this quickly. Um, <laughs> But it just gives you a little bit of an idea of maybe how some of the, the buildings there look, just the mass amounts of people that there are everywhere. Um, you can see there's a bunch of um, buses and trains. The stairs there go down into underground metro. Uh, there are just tons of people everywhere that you go. Um, a lot of this footage was actually taken at what's called the Verdish Marti Theater, which the word tier just means square. Um, and there's a lot of tourists that are there, but a lot of people who just live there and work there as well. This is probably one of the most densely populated areas around the fifth district of Budapest. Um, but just, my heart was just burdened, and I'm just asking God, I said, Lord, have these people had an opportunity to hear about Jesus? Do they know, have they had a chance even to hear the message of the gospel? And if they haven't, how are we going to be able to effectively get it to them so that they'll listen and we can get it to everyone. Um, just some of the things we are praying about. There's a great need for laborers in the country of Buda and the country of Hungary, the city of Budapest. Um, while we were there on our survey trip, we were able to go soul winning in three different cities in Hungary. Uh, I was able to share the gospel and my testimony several times to some English speakers, um, and uh, and also through a translator. Ramona was able to share. Uh, her testimony in the gospel in Hungarian. Uh, there are four people that trusted Christ during the time that we were there. Um, I was privileged to be the silent partner to one encounter. I was able to watch the Hungarian man go through his Bible and I at least could tell what book he was in. Um, but this 14-year-old uh, put his trust in Christ and three others um, were other Hungarian people sharing the gospel with their own people. It was really exciting to see. Um, so um, I, I forgot to push in the next slide there, but that was really, really awesome. And we were encouraged with how many people were open to having conversations with us. Um, we were able to just go up to groups of young people and talk with them, and they were willing to listen. Even if they weren't interested, they would politely tell us that they didn't, that they weren't interested. They didn't, um, they weren't real nasty to us or anything like that, which is, I'm not used to that in Milwaukee. You can definitely get some people that are not so nice to you. Um, but uh, just, there are so many people that need the Lord, and they're, they're willing to have conversations. In fact, there was one guy who claimed to be post-modernist. Um, this is before we went on our survey trip, but he, um, Pastor Zoli talked to him, and this guy says he's post-modernist. He doesn't even claim to believe in actual reality. So he said, I'm not really sure if the conversation we're having right now is real or not. Um, I, you know, I don't know if it was either, I guess, but, um, <laughs> but anyways, my, Zoli asked him, well, do you claim to be an open-minded person? And he said, yes. He said, well, then can I share with you what the Bible says about, about Jesus and having eternal life? And he said, sure. <laughs> uh, so Pastor Zoli was able to go through the gospel with him, and he didn't get saved right then, um, but he was willing to hear the truth. And it is not our job to save anyone. <laughs> it's our job to preach the gospel to them. It's the Lord that does the saving. Um, but anyways, we are going to the city of Budapest specifically. There are 23 districts there in that city. You can really think of these 23 districts as cities within a city. It can take over an hour just to get from one side of the city to the other if traffic is good. Um, and the current churches in Budapest right now, there are only two of them. Um, one was started four years ago. Uh, in the third district, that's where Pastor Zoli Kish is, and there's a second one in the 17th district. But to just give you a perspective, there, District 3 has one church for around 130,000 people, and District 17 has one church for around 87,000 people. Uh, there are still 21 districts in the city of Budapest, 1.5 million people with no independent Baptist church within their district. If Ramon and I were to share Jesus one-on-one -on -one with 10 people every day, which would mean that she'd have to get a babysitter and go out there, or I would be the babysitter and she could go out and... But anyways, if we talked to one, um, to 10 people um, every single day, it would take us 233 years to speak with every person just in the city of Budapest alone. Uh, so there is a great need 
for more people to come and help us in Hungary. Um, we'll, we will, if you, anyone wants to come to Hungary, we'll definitely, my wife will help give you some free Hungarian lessons. You can come and assist us over there. Um, but seriously, if you do have some interest in Hungary and coming and helping us, let us know. We'd uh, love to help you out there. Um, Pastor Zoli and Johanna Kish are who we plan to work with initially. Um, Johanna is actually Ramona's cousin. Um, so our mission while we go over there is to win souls, to spend many hours weekly in evangelism, discipling new converts uh, with the goal of planting churches and training leaders. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, the, As uh, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And our plan then is to work with Pastor Zoli Kish in the third district of Budapest as I learn Hungarian. And then we'll, we'll plan to start multiple new churches within Budapest and other needy cities in Hungary and train Hungarian men and women to win souls and to disciple their own people. So pl please, please pray that God would use our family to reach Hungary for the Lord Jesus. Um, you can sign up for our prayer updates either on our clipboard downstairs or you can do it on our website as well. If I had more time, I would ask for questions right now, but if you have them, come and talk to us throughout the week, all right? So thank you for the opportunity to present. Well, Brother Allen, if you have questions for him after the service, we're going to have an international snack. Uh, Mrs. Roddy is preparing some, uh, some Mexican snacks for us. Uh, and that's going to be immediately after the service downstairs. Um, let me run for, through a couple other announcements here. If you're wondering what's happening during this conference, on the back table there underneath the map, there are a number of conference schedules. And it says who's speaking, which nights, who's giving their presentation, who's going to be with the children, all those kinds of things. So I'd encourage you to pick up a, a conference, conference schedule and you'll know what's going on. So. Uh, as you see, there's a lot of flags here in the auditorium, and uh, these flags and the pictures next to them represent ministry partners that we have currently supported uh, by our church here. And um, to try and incentivize learning uh, and getting to know our, our missionary partners, uh, we have a lot of chocolate if you're willing to memorize the flags or the uh, names of the missionaries in those countries or even their family names. And so, um, Miss Stefka, Stefka, can you wave? And uh, Miss Stefka is the one to say flags to. So, children, teens, adults, if you want some chocolate, see Miss Stefka um, anytime during this conference or uh, Freedom. But Freedom, he's not, he's had to work tonight. Okay. Um, but so see Stefka or Mr. Freedom to say flags, but if you say all the names of the countries of the flags, you get some chocolate. If you can name all of the families in each country, you get more chocolate. And if you can name everybody in each family and the, the family name and the country, you'll get a whole boatload of chocolate. Okay? So uh, if you're wondering, how do I memorize the names of the flags? Well, um, if you're a church member, this afternoon you got a brand new missions booklet in your mailbox that's got all the all that information in it and as well children on the back table or uh, on the back wall there you can see pictures of all the missionary families and uh, the countries that they're going to um so missions conference tomorrow thursday friday thursday uh saturday morning there are three different ladies brunches at three different locations uh so ladies uh the, there's a sign up on the back and you can text uh, the hostess to find out um, what she would like you to prepare and bring to share for brunch. For the guys, uh, we are going to go bowling Saturday morning um, and at 11 o'clock um, at the Set'em Up Lanes in Griffith. And um, if you need a ride from the church building because your wife's taking your car or something like that, um, I'm going to be leaving here from the church parking lot with the church van. Uh, so you can just let me know that you need a ride, and I'd be happy to give you one. Um, and then um, Saturday evening, Saturday evening, we're having an international indoor picnic at 5.30 downstairs. 
Uh, Mrs. Furlong is uh, getting all the food prepared for that, um, getting it arranged and all that. So you just need to come. But you need to bring your lawn chairs or your picnic blanket. Uh, and we'll have a grand old indoor picnic downstairs in the gym. Um, and be sure to wear your international costume for that. Okay? Wear your international costumes. Uh, and then my last announcement is um, if Snowmageddon actually happens, um, which uh, the forecasters are saying is coming our way, uh, if that happens tomorrow when we get a big snowstorm, uh, we will still plan on having the conference for anyone that can make it. So, I mean, I live across the creek. I have no excuse for not coming. Um, and Pastor Lee is just down the street that way. But if you get snowed in tomorrow, um, know that we're going to be live streaming the missions conference service at 7 o'clock. So you can, uh, you know, uh, watch from your living room on your TV or something. Uh, just go to YouTube and look for Dire Baptist, and uh, it'll be on the live stream at, at, at 7 o'clock. Um, we are now going to dismiss the children for a very special presentation with uh, brother Matt Gardner and his wife Savannah. They're headed to the country of Uganda. So Mrs. Rosnick is heading to this door over here. So all the boys and girls in here, you see Mrs. Rosnick over there underneath the Ugandan flag? Yeah, you could go with her and she's going to take you down to the teen room for a special missionary presentation with the gardeners. So parents afterwards, please don't just leave. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Rosnick will appreciate it. They're going to be directly downstairs beneath us in the teen room, in the teen room. So you can pick them up directly after the service and uh, then go on to the international snacks in the gym. All right, let's stand together and turn for our final song to number 343. Number 343, Jesus said that he had come to seek and to save those that were lost. And so our, the question we can ask ourselves tonight as we sing this is, how much are we seeking the lost around us like Jesus did? Number 343. Missions Conference is a wonderful time, and you get to meet lots of people all at the same time and get their names mixed up and what country they're going to. And, and so I'm just, I'm just going to get right out there and head this thing off at the pass. In a moment, Mrs. Wagner is going to sing. 
Okay? She's sitting next to her husband. Can you all wave to us? Okay? They belong together. Okay? A different man is preaching tonight. Okay? They are not married to each other. We've had this happen before where one missionary uh, sings and another missionary preaches, and for the rest of the week, everyone thinks they're married. They're not, okay? So just let's be clear on that. Mrs. Wagner is singing. She and her husband are headed to uh, Southeast Asia. You'll hear more about that in a future service. Um, And then after Mrs. Wagner sings, Brother Tobby, notice the different last names, Brother Tobby is going to preach. And uh, we've supported Brother Tobby and his family here from Dyer Baptist Church for eight years or so. Uh, We were privileged to take them on right as they were getting going to the field. And the Lord has done some wonderful things. I I just am so excited about partnering with them and the work in Nepal. And I'm eager to hear what he has to say from God's Word tonight. It's, it's, It's good to learn about countries, good to learn about people, but it's the Word of God, after all, that is the most important thing. And he has a message for us tonight that I trust you'll have an open heart for. Mrs. Wagner, would you please come? And then Brother Tavi. Thank you. <clears throat> when disappointments of my life surround and cause my heart to feel before within God's word my trembling spirit hides I learn to trust his wisdom more and more God's word my guide my leadership within ordain my steps to
Amen. It's good to be with you tonight. I um, want to say thank you to the church for partnering with our family. Uh, my wife Amber is here with us and uh, my three kids. Last time we were here, we had two. The first time we were here, we had one. Um, and so no promises next time we come back. Uh, but it is good to be with you all tonight. And, and uh, I've been charged with bringing the Word of God tonight. And uh, so on, on Sunday, I'll have opportunity to share more about uh, what the Lord has done in the country of Nepal. Our family's been there. Uh, we got there seven years ago, and the Lord is blessed, and, and uh, it's, it's fruits to this church's account uh, because of what your, this church has done in praying for us and in partnering with us and, and loving us, encouraging us, and uh, so we're excited to uh, share that with you. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 1, and I uh, hope tonight to share with you uh, that missions, as we gather together tonight to talk about missions conference and, and the mission that the church has been given to do, uh, I'd like to show you tonight that missions is God's work. It is God's work. It's not a missionary's work. Uh, it's not uh, the idea of Pastor Adkinson. It's not the idea of uh, Dyer Baptist Church. It's not the idea of a mission board uh, or anything like that. It is God's plan. It is God's work that he started when he sent Christ to die on the cross for the sins of the world and uh, started his church and he sent his church to go into the world preaching the gospel, the work of missions, uh, is the work of God. And uh, we'll see this all the way back in Genesis chapter 1 uh, when we first see that man, God's last creation, man is created in the image of God. He created us male and female, the image of God, image bearers, and he sent them on mission. He sent them to do work. And what we see is the work that God gave Adam and Eve is the same work that God started in his creation. We're going to look at that tonight. Genesis chapter 1. We'll go ahead and read uh, verses 1 and 2 uh, and, and pray before we uh, continue on tonight. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Let's pray tonight. Lord God, I thank you uh, for your goodness. I thank you for this time that we've had together already, and, and hearing about the need of countries around this world. Lord, I pray that you would send more laborers to Hungary. Uh, Lord God, that you would uh, get your servants there quickly. I pray, Lord God, that you would uh, bless the children in their time tonight. And I thank you for the time of singing and, and prayer and uh, just all... We ask, Lord, that it would all be done for your honor and glory, and especially tonight, Lord, as we open up your word, that you would speak to us, and that you'd use this time to touch our hearts and prepare us for the work that you want to do in and through us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we just got done reading here Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, verses that uh, we've learned, many of us, from a very young age. We can quote them. We know uh, about God creating the heaven and earth. And here in verse 2 of chapter 1, uh, we very quickly see a problem. And God recognizes this problem and says the earth was without form and void. And so God's creation, he starts here in verse 1, he creates everything, and he looks and he sees that his creation is incomplete. Uh, or we could say in comparison to the end of his seven day work, his six days of work, uh, when he says it is good, uh, the starting out here is incomplete, it's bad in comparison, and so God is going to continue the work that he started in creation. And so he works for six days. He has these two problems, these two things that are incomplete about heaven and earth. Uh, the first one is, is that the earth was without form. And so nothing had a place. Everything was kind of just moving around wherever it wanted to. It has uh, like chaos and, and without form, without order. And the second thing God says is he looks out as, as his creation uh, before the six days, and he says it's void. There, there's nothing in it. It's empty. And so God, who does all things good and all things complete, he sets out to do his six days of work to complete his creation. And so day one, here we see in, in verse 3 of chapter 1, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And, and so first day of creation, God looks and says, okay, we have, uh, we have this problem, it's incomplete, it's without form, and so God takes the light and the darkness and he gives it a place. 
He, he, he forms it. He gives it order. He puts it in where it's supposed to go. And God says, all right, the light stays over here. and darkness, you stay here. Everybody has their place. It's orderly. And what does God say? It's good. I formed it. It was without form. And I've worked. And now it has form. And the second day, God gets back to work. God said, let there be firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. So second day, he separates the upper firmament, the upper waters from the lower waters and the upper atmosphere, or lower atmosphere, and God separates it. He gives it a place. He forms it. He puts it where he wants it. He puts it in its place in an orderly way. And God says at the end of second day, it is good. It was without form and now I have given it form. And on the third day, again, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called the seas. And God saw that it was good. And so the third day, God comes. He, he's separated. He's given place, form, to the light and the darkness, to the upper waters and the lower waters. And God comes and says, okay, we have... Water's over here, land stays here, everything has its place, he forms it, gives it boundaries, he's given it order and form, and God says it is good. And so we see here in verse 2 is this problem, the incompleteness, it was without form, and God works for three days, and at the end he says it's good. I have given this creation that was without form, I have now given it order, I've given it boundaries, I've given it place, and it's good, but there's still one problem left, right? It was without form. And God fixed it, gave it form. And then he says it was void. It was empty. And so God, again, for three more days, he goes back to work. Day four, uh, corresponding to day number one, right? He separated the light from the darkness. But he says it's still empty. So God comes in on the fourth day and he fills the light and darkness that he's already separated, that he's formed. And so he puts the sun and the moon and the stars. He fills the light and the darkness that he divided on the first day. And then on the fifth day, God comes again and begins his work and he looks to the upper waters, the upper skies, and the lower atmosphere, the lower waters, and he's given it form, he's given it order, but it's still empty, it's void. And so God puts birds in the sky and he puts fish in the sea and he fills what he's already formed and ordered on the second day. And then the, the last day of creation, sixth day, God comes. He separated the waters, uh, the land from the waters, given it place and, and form and order. It's still void. And so God comes. He says, all right, we have the land here. It's empty. And so he creates all the trees, all the life and the animals and, and all the creeping things, the insects and all the bugs. Every, everywhere God fills the creation that he has made. And so we see day one through three, God gives form, and day four, five, and six, God fills the creation. And so what do we see here in God's creation? God is a God that is at work. He looks into this world, his creation, what he has made, and he is forming, and he is filling, he is at work. And at the very end of his creation, he says, it's good, it's very good, all that I have done. And he creates man in the image of God. In God's image, here in verse 20, 26, in chapter 1, we read, God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them." And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so God here, He comes, He creates man, we're in God's image. That teaches us two things, that we are different from other creation, and that God has given us a special purpose. If you are here tonight, and and this is the first time coming to church, first time hearing from the Word of God. Uh, the Bible teaches us that we uh, have been created for a special purpose, uh, to do the work of God, to have communion with God. Uh, not like other living things, but we are created special in the image of God. But it also teaches us that we are not God. We are image bearers of God, but we are not God. 
We are different from God. We are separate from Him. Uh, but we were created after His image to do a very special work. And what we see here in, in the creation of man is that the work that God has started, He laid this foundation. He created the heavens and the earth and He goes to work and for three days He, he gives everything a place and He orders it and He gives it boundary and He gives it rules. And then the second part of His creation, the second three days, God goes and He begins filling all these areas, all these places that He has created. And He gives it life and He gives it uh, abundance and, and wonderful things for the enjoyment uh, of His creation. And He looks to man and, and this foundation, this start of this work that God has done, He looks to man, His image bearers, and He says, I want you to continue doing this same work. He says, I've got it started for you. I did all the hard work, all the heavy lifting. I've got it all started, and I just want you to continue doing this work. And so we see God looks to man. He says the first thing. He says, let them have dominion. Yeah. What does that mean? He says, if anything goes out of order, it's man's job to make sure it goes back into the order that God has placed it in. That we are to have dominion. That we are to make sure all things are to stay in form in the way that God created them, that we would make sure, here in verse 28, it says, God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it. What does that mean? It's make sure everything stays in form, in the boundaries that God, according to the rules that God has placed in this world, it was man's job, according to the first three days of God's creation, that we would continue to bring form and order to the world around us continuing to do the work that God started in His creation. And not only that, God said, let them be, uh, He says unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So what's the second job God gave man to do? Not only were we to subdue it and keep everything in form and order, God says, I want you to keep filling the world. Just as I filled for three days, I, I got you started. I got a foundation here. I, I've given you everything you need. I've created you male and female to fill and to replenish and multiply. I've given you all the resources. I, I've showed you how to do it. And so God looks to man and says, just as I have filled, he says, I want you to continue filling and replenish and, and to multiply on this world, in, in this earth that I've made, uh, to continue doing the work that God has started. And so we see very clearly in creation that the work that God has given us, the work that God has given us to do is the work that He has started. The work that He has done. As image bearers of God, we are to do the work that God has done, continue on after the example of our Father in heaven. Do the example that God has started. But we know the story, right? Adam and Eve, they didn't do the work that God gave them to do. Instead, they turned, and when the serpent came, and the serpent started talking, I believe the serpent was not supposed to talk. It was not according to the form that God had made it. And the serpent comes and starts talking. It was Adam and Eve's responsibility to say, no, that's not the order. You need to get back into form. You need to get back into the boundary that God has created you. And instead, they begin listening to the serpent. And they've gone out of order, out of the form that God had made. And so they failed in the first work. And then as the serpent begins talking to them, instead of them teaching the serpent about the things of God, the serpent starts telling them about his view of God. And they listen. Instead of looking to fill the world, they begin looking inwardly at their own, their own wants their own desires, looking to hoard and to keep for themselves rather than to fill and do the work as God did, that God was giving and God was filling and God was, uh, was multiplying all things in this world. Instead, they started to begin looking inwardly and what can I get and what can I have and what can I, what can I be? And they messed up the work that God had given them to do. They looked to other things rather than the work of God and they sinned against God, they sinned against this world, and they fell from their relationship with God. The fall of man, because they did not do the work that God gave them to do. And, and through the Bible, we understand that all people have come from, from the line of Adam, that we are as our father Adam, that we failed to do the will of God. That we failed in the work. And we see in the Word of God tonight that uh, outside of Christ, 
we are unable to do the work of God. That since Adam, every person has failed. Every man has been a sinner. Every man has looked to themselves and has done it not according to the plans of God, the will of God, but instead according to uh, their father, Adam, until one person, Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, came to do what no man was able to do. He came as a man because it was man who was given the job to do the work of God. And so Jesus came and, and he lived the perfect life. He lived according to the will of God. And as the perfect man, he fulfilled the work that his father gave him to do. And continually, several times, God from heaven, he spoke so where people could hear. And he said, this is my son. I am well pleased. He has done all that I've told him to do. You need to listen to him. You need to uh, follow him because he has done what none other has done. He has done what no one was able to do. He has obeyed and he has done the work that I have given him to do. And what was the work that God gave Jesus to do? He came and he went to the cross to die on the cross for the sins of the world. For all people, all of God's fallen creation, all those who turned away from God, all those that were separate from God, that were fallen from God's grace, fallen from God's salvation, that Christ came and He gave His life according to the will of the Father to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And Christ completed His work. When He died on the cross, He said, it is finished. I have done what God has sent me to do. Yes. Not in His divine nature, but as, as a man, He re relied on God to sustain Him and, and to give Him uh, the ability to help Him on the cross and he said, I have done what God has sent me to do. And then he looks to the church. He looks to the church and he said, just as God has sent me, we see in the book of John, John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said, just as God has sent me, even so send I you. And the book of John is, is almost mimicking uh, the book of Genesis in, in God's creation, Genesis, uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, says in the beginning was the Word, just as we read in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created. And so this Word, uh, the Creator, Christ, uh, he, he spoke, uh, He was the Word uh, that gave life. It says that without Him was nothing was created that was made. Uh, Jesus came and, and He was the true image bearer of God. He looked to his disciples through the book of John. He says, you look to me, you see God. He says, I am the image bearer. I am, I, I am the image of God in heaven. If you want to know God, he says, you have to come through me. And tonight, the same is true. If you want a relationship with God in heaven, your creator, there's only one mediator and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the only way to God. He's the only way of salvation, and in no other name is there salvation except by the name of Christ. And Jesus looks to us, and in Colossians chapter 3, we're going to end here tonight. In Colossians chapter 3, we see something very amazing, something very unique here in the book of Colossians. As we, we saw in Genesis chapter 1, that God created, He did this amazing work, uh, this creating work, and at the end of His creation, He created man in the image of God, and, and that showed us that we are to continue to do the work that God has started, and God has laid the foundation, and God sends us, just as He sent Adam and Eve to replenish the earth and subdue and do the work that God has done. We see here in Colossians chapter 3 that in salvation, we call upon the name of the Lord in repentance of sin, and, and God saves us, and He gives us a new man. Here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 10, it says, And have put on the new man. So that old man that was, according to Adam, that had sinned against God, that had rebelled against God, that had failed to do the will of God, that had failed to do the work of God, that had gone away from God, that old man, he says, it's, it's been crucified with Christ, has been put away. And in verse 10 he says, Now we have been put on with a new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. 
And so now once again, and according to Adam, our father Adam, we had fallen away from being true image bearers, of being able to image God, to be an image bearer for His honor and glory. We were unable in our sin, unable in our rebellion to do that work. But now once again in our second birth, once again in our salvation and our sanctification, God has given us once again a new man. And he says this new man that God has given us in salvation, he says it is according to the image of the Creator. So now once again, now that we have been saved, now once we have been put in Christ, he says we can once again, not because of who we are, not because of anything that we have, but because we have been put in Christ and Christ has put on us His image, now through salvation we can once again become image bearers of God. It's not something that we can do outside of salvation. It's not something we can do just because we were born as man or woman. It is only in salvation through the name of Jesus Christ that we can once again be made image bearers of our Creator in heaven. And so what does that mean? He says here in verse 11, he says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all, put on therefore. So now he looks to us, he says, you've been made an image bearer of God, and so what does that make us do? He says, now, because you've been made an image bearer, now you can do the work of God. The work that God started when He sent Christ to die on the cross, the promise that He made all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, that He was going to redeem this world from their sin. He's going to bring them back. He's going to provide salvation. He's going to provide a way uh, for us to be once again brought together with God in heaven. He says He started this work all the way from the fall of man. He started this work and he's been working, he's been laying the foundation, and Christ comes and, and he dies on the cross for our sins, and, and he provides a way for all people to come unto God. And the foundation, Jesus said, I, I, I've laid the foundation. Everything that is necessary, he says, I've given it to you. I, I, I've given you the church, I've given you the word of God, I've given you all things. The foundation has been laid, and he says, he looks at his disciples at the church. He says, God sent me to do this work, to start this work. And he says, now I'm sending you, John chapter 20, verse 21, now I'm sending you to do this same work, to go into the world and tell people that there is a God in heaven that loves them and that died on the cross for their sins and that in him there is salvation. We continue to do the work of God because we are after the image of him that created us. Verse 12, he says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, all these things that Christ taught us. All these things that Christ was the example, the true image bearer of God. He showed it to him. He was the example. And he says, Now that you're in the image of me, he says, Now therefore go as I have gone. Verse 13, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do, look at this last verse here, verse 17. He says, whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. This commission that Christ gave the church, and Paul reminds us here in the book of Colossians, he says this, as you go as, as an image bearer, you've been changed, the old man has passed away, all things are made new, this image that God has given us as image bearers, he says, whatever you do, that, that, that's all of us tonight, that's all of us, whatever you do, in, in word, everything you say, in deed, everything you're doing, he says, let it all be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
that everywhere we go, whether it's our workplace, whether it's the mission field, whether it's uh, with our family, whether it's with our neighbor, everything we do, everything we say, it should bear the name of Christ. We're His image bearers, and we do the work that God has given us to do. God started a work long ago on the cross of Calvary, and He finished the work, and He looked to us tonight, and He says, would you do the work that I've given you to do? Would you do the work as image bearers of Christ? Would you go and would you share to all those, the, all people, all nations, and God loves all people, died on the cross for all people. We heard of Hungary with 10, 10 million people, Nepal with 30 million people, countries like India with 1.2 billion people, and God died for every single soul. God loves all people, no matter what color, no matter what language, no matter what country, no matter what tribe. God loves all people. And He says, I've started this work and I've sent you. I have given it over to you. Just as I have done, go and do the same. Even as God has sent me, so send I you. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is the mission that God has given us to do. And as image bearers, we can do the work that God has given us to do. I'll ask Pastor to come tonight and close us uh, as I pray. Pastor is going to come. Lord God, I thank you uh, for the work that you started. I thank you for your life-giving work that only you can do. I thank you for your great creation and all things that you have done that are good. I pray, Lord God, tonight that if you worked in our lives and you have made us image bearers, Lord, that you would help us to do that work, that you, would, that you would send us in the name of Jesus to all the world to share about your great love that you have for all people. Work in this church tonight. Work in our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. Um, we'll have the pianist play in just a moment, but I don't think we'll sing tonight. Um, I want us to ponder a couple of questions. Um, so, to help you with concentration, um, let's all just go ahead and bow our heads again. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. But I'm going to ask you to think. The Bible says that you're made in the image of God. And that we then have the opportunity to carry on the work of God. Are you doing that? Or have you accepted the mistaken notion that you are to do your own work, your own thing? Remember we heard that being in the image of God means that we are not God. Are you carrying on his work? Are you living for lesser things? And the second question is, have you yourself been reconciled to God? Have you realized that you, like everybody else, are a broken sinner, alienated from God, and needing someone to bring you back to him? If you've not had that reconciling experience with God, please don't put it off. You can be made right with God, but you have to come to Him through Christ. So let's go ahead and have the piano play and ask ourselves these questions. Am I carrying on the work of God? Am I even reconciled to God?
Paul said that he was like an ambassador, begging and pleading people to be reconciled with God. Have you been reconciled? If you have been, are you doing your job as an ambassador? Are you pleading with others? I hope that you will. Lord, we thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that we are not meaningless accidents on this random planet, but that we are your unique and special creation. Help us to be faithful, to accomplish the work that you've created us to do, to know you, to glorify you, and to tell others about you. Lord, I don't know how you're working in hearts tonight. I really don't. But I pray that you will. And then in each mind and heart, you'll find surrender. That we will accept the truth that you have for us. In Jesus' name. If you have questions or want to discuss the, the message further, I know Brother Tobby would be glad to talk with you, as would I. I'm going to ask at this time our missionary guests to go ahead and be dismissed and head downstairs to the gym for a time of fellowship. So our missionaries, we're going to give them a head start, and the rest of us will head down there to, uh, first of all, pick up children if we have kids in the kids' ministry or in the nursery and then head on down to the gym where you can meet the missionaries, find out more about their fields and countries, and have a time of uh, food and fellowship as well. Thank you again so much for being here tonight. We're off to a great start, and look forward to what the Lord will do among us tomorrow. Take care.